three seconds. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Dispatch. We've got a full agenda here, so we'd like to get started right away. Let me go to the next slide. There we go. And so this being the first session of the meeting, I want to really emphasize the uh, content of the note well, which uh, is a condition of your participation here at, uh, at IETF. Um, there's uh, a number of processes that you should be aware of, uh, a number of uh, uh, things uh, having to do with uh, intellectual property and uh, making sure that the uh, uh, IETF patent policy is followed. If you're not aware of what this document says, you should read it in detail, please. Next slide. And we now have a note really well, which deals with things like anti-harassment procedures and, and things like that. We want to be good to each other in this meeting and in general in IETF. And so uh, we want to make uh, everyone feel comfortable with their participation. And we ask that everyone contribute to making this a positive environment for everyone. Next slide. <clears throat> So the session is being recorded. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're here or if you're participating remotely, well, I guess if you're participating remotely, you're already signed into Meet Echo. But if you're here in the meeting, you need to sign into Meet Echo. That's the way that we keep track of how many people are participating in the sessions. And um, uh, there's, you know, there's a what's referred to as the Meet Echo Lite client that you can get to from the uh, IETF agenda page. <clears throat> uh, we'll be using that also to manage the, uh, the microphone queue. Please keep your audio and video off if you're not, if you're, um, if you're not using the, uh, if, if you're using the full client just so that we don't get feedback. <clears throat> Next slide. It's loading. And uh, of course, uh, here's uh, agenda, meet echo and so forth, um, and uh, how you report issues. So on with the agenda. We have, uh, we're in the middle of the status and agenda bash. Uh, we have um, uh, four presentations for the, the dispatch part of this meeting, and this is joint with the uh, uh, art area uh, meeting, which uh, nominally begins at 11 o'clock uh, and uh, has a number of, uh, number of issues that, a uh, number of topics that might be of interest to people that are partic participating, particularly in that area. Any... Uh, comments, ba any, any bashing that needs to be done to this agenda. Okay. Do we have any volunteers to assist as note takers? Oh, Barry, are you raising your hand? Would the people at the back of the room please close the door? We're getting a little bit of extra audio we didn't need. Thank you. Ah, Bron has volunteered to take notes. Thank you, Bron. You're a you're a world class note taker. So, <laughs> we have we have two mailing lists. We have the general uh, applications area uh, mailing list at Art, and then there's another mailing list for this working group called Dispatch. The difference being that uh, Art is is more topics, I would say more, more technical, more detail about the topics, whereas dispatch were really focused on what the purpose of the dispatch part of this meeting is, which is to determine where in IETF 
or if at IETF is the right place to do a particular item that's being described. So, I mean, we have a number of options, uh, which include things like um, creating a working group, uh, moving, uh, deciding that a topic is relevant to an existing working group. Uh, there is a, 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 a area director sponsored uh, for, a, for an individual draft. There's uh, the uh, independent submissions editor. Um, and then there's also just, uh, it's possible that uh, people will look at a particular piece of work and say, you know, it's, it's not appropriate topic for art or for IETF. I mean, it could go into a different area as well. So that's, that's kind of what we're here about. Please, please be focused on trying to answer what we call as the dispatch question, which is where does this piece of work go rather than getting into too much detail about the topic? Yes. Hi, Ben Campbell. Just wanted to add one more category to your choices, which is to send something to a buff. Uh, 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 doing a buff for something. Yes, thank you. I, I was just doing it off the top of my head and didn't have a full list. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Okay. Okay, so now we start the, the session and our first speaker. Okay, so hi. Um, I would like to present to you <clears throat> a draft that we've been working on for around a year now. Um, the technology itself we're working on for, I think, dec a decade. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure I remember correctly. Um, this is joint work with Christian Gotov, Ben Fix, and um, I'm Martin. Uh, next slide, please. So I don't really have time to um, go into the details of what a distributed hash table is, but R5N is a distributed hash table. Essentially, you can store um, keys, uh, values under keys in a um, essentially a peer-to-peer -peer system. But R5N has some very specific design goals that I think fit better in, in today's world. Um, for example, it has open participation peer-to-peer -peer routing, so it does not have access control. It works in restricted route environments, which I will get into detail. Um, it supports route path recording, which um, is an interesting feature for source routing. <clears throat> it has in-band request and response validation for improved caching and um, a loss for result filtering. Next slide, please. So regarding the, um, the open participation peer-to-peer -peer routing, there is actually already an RFC, which is called Reload um, 6940, um, which in its security model specifies that each node um, receives basically a, a certificate from a central issuer, or it implicitly is already trusted because it's in a closed network. However, that's not really how modern DHTs are used or work. So what you actually need is some kind of a DHT that, um, that allows open participation with all its drawbacks and all the trade-offs you have uh, if you don't have like an, a trusted nodes uh, entering the network. Next slide, please. Um, the second, and uh, I'm going to talk about this most uh, important property, is support for restricted route environments. Now, the DHT itself, uh, there exists a publication for it, um, published in, uh, if I remember correctly, 2011, and it defines a restricted route topology um, simply as a, a topology where <clears throat> nodes cannot directly establish connections with each other. And this, for common DHT routing protocols, basically everything Kademlia like um, is a problem which we will see later as well. So basically that will cause the, the distributed hash table to work in, in, a, um, in a diminished fashion or doesn't work at all. So you cannot really retrieve any values at all. 
And we argue that this uh, restricted route to, um, property is actually very common in today's internet. Like it's, it's not like you can assume that all peers can directly connect with each, with each other. They are most likely behind either a firewall or NAT, or um, maybe they are connecting through some kind of a, um, a mesh network. Next slide, please. Um, so this is actually a slide that's just for documentation. Maybe next slide. To visualize a bit what what is meant by restricted route topologies. So if you have like a distributed hash table, Kademlia based, and <clears throat> you would want it to draw up a, a set of nodes and they connect as if, you know, in a sunshine case, they would want to connect with the nodes to properly establish the DHT and have every um, um, key essentially also reachable in the network. It would, would look a bit like this. However, in, in reality, when you have a restricted route topology, which we argue that you usually have, next slide, um, it probably looks more like this. And this doesn't really look like a problem. There's no node like uh, separate from the whole network or something like this. It's, it's a small world topology. But still, for, for, for um, a, routing met uh, a routing mechanism like XOR-based distance routing in Kademlia, this is a problem. Next slide. Because when you are looking, or you can see that when you are basically calculating the X or distance to specific key prefixes, you will notice that you, cert you certainly have local minima in the network. So depending on where you are in the network and you're starting a route towards a key, you will end up in different parts of the network, which is bad because depending on where you are on the network, it, it's possible that you cannot really find um, the value that you're looking for. And we're going to give an example next, next slide. That is the example of um, you could easily like remove such uh, local minima if there were a connection between two peers. But since we're assuming that those connections cannot be made, for example, due to NATO or firewall, um, that is not an option. Next slide, please. So if we had a regular X, uh, X or routing metric, like uh, any Kademlia THT does, you can see that if we wanted to store a value, let's say under the key 0011, and the peer that wants to store this value is 1111, it would basically, if you're doing a, like a, a greedy descent towards that key, it would end up at this 000 peer, and that is the responsible peer for the value, and <clears throat> that's where it's going to be stored. However, if a peer, such as on the, on the left um, side, like 1001, would now try to resolve this key, it would end up with the local minimum on, on the top, and it would not receive this value. And no matter how often we put this value or how often we now try to receive this value, we would just never get it. So basically, that's a, um, that's a problem you usually have in those restricted route topologies. Next slide. Now, what R5N does is, before doing like this greedy descent towards the key, um, the, the routing algorithm first takes a random route through the network. Now, this is an example for a random walk of length one through the network before the degree descent happens. But usually, the, the length of the, of the uh, randomized walk should depend more or less on the, on the network size. You can see that here, first we're doing a random walk to some peer and then start the degree descent, which coincidentally also ends up at the same local minimum. Next slide. But at the same time, it could also be that our uh, random walk uh, would end up, when we're doing degree descent, at the other local minimum. And basically, the idea is that as long as we have a small world topology, when we do a random walk, we will end up at a random peer, which will then, after a degree descent towards a key, end up at a random local minimum. And uh, taking into account the birthday paradox, this allows us to efficiently or ensure that the availability of um, of values for every peer in the network <clears throat> is very high. Basically, you can make the calculations, but doing just like a square root of n um, puts in that case um, will probably get you the, the value at any point in the network with high probability. Next slide. Next slide is just an example for you. If you're wondering what would happen if we are directly uh, ending up on, the, on, on one local minimum in that case, I mean, that is a technical detail of the current implementation. Um, we would then still start a greedy descent towards the next local minimum, and then basically end up storing it at the bottom, uh, at the top again. Next slide. So, um, so much to, for restricted routes, but we also had an, uh, other design goals like uh, route recording for source routing. So, when you, whenever you do like a put to a value, you record, um, or the, the protocol records which hops are taken through the network. 
And whenever you retrieve the value, the same hops are also recorded, which basically gives you a working path through the network <coughs> because the communication channel peer to peer does not always work. But if those peers on, on, the, um, on the path through the network from which you retrieve the value um, allows you to at least forwards or proxies uh, transmissions, this allows you to effectively implement source-based routing based on metadata provided by the distributed hash table. Uh, next slide. Finally, uh, or the, the second to last part is inbound response validation. Um, so basically the idea is that in order to in, in particular improve caching, but also to not store essentially garbage values, the DHD allows a pluggable mechanism to, al to allow any peer on the path to verify if the value that is being put actually matches the key and the type of data that is being put. Um, we're actually using this mechanism, uh, using cryptographic signatures in um, RFC to be 94, 98, where we are using very specific uh, blinded um, signatures in order to ensure the uh, integrity of the payload. Next slide, please. Um, another feature that uh, it implements is result filtering via muted bloom filter. So whenever you're looking for a value, essentially you can provide a bloom filter with values that you have already received. Um, the reason why this is implemented is because we also support storing multiple different values under the same key. And it's possible that those results come in um, with a delay in between. So you may want to, for example, pause uh, the, the retrieval of the values or maybe constantly listen to the values. And at that point, you probably want to say, okay, I'm not interested in very specific values anymore. And this is done um, uh, by providing a bloom filter along with the request that is basically saying, I'm not interested in the set of um, results anymore. Next slide, please. And the final property, and this is also um, interesting in terms of because we're doing the random walk through the network, uh, we're trying to prevent routing loops through a similar concept. So basically, with every hop, we are uh, the, the protocol also uh, manages a bloom filter where all of the hops are stored inside um, so that we can potentially reduce routing loops because we never really want to revisit any uh, hop in the network because we, as quickly as possible, want to converge towards another uh, minima in the, minimum in the network <clears throat> because the primary problem we're trying to solve is finding another minimum. Next slide, please. Okay, so much to uh, the, the design goals and security properties of the, the work. As I said, it's, we've been working uh, roughly a re year on this draft now. Um, we have already approached some research groups and working groups. Um, we have already received very valuable feedback as well. Um, we have not yet been in contact with any working group that would like to take it as a work item which is basically also why we're here. So maybe if you're interested, if you know who's interested, or if um, some working group crystallizes, then we would be happy to discuss our work and um, essentially also modify it uh, with input that we re receive. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Martin. Any comments, questions? Please um, focus on the dispatch question and uh, your name and the company first. Thank you. So Cullen Jennings, don't think the company matters. Um, the, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I think that this is a, a big substantial piece of work. I'm, I'm one of the authors of Reload before, so, um, I, and I think it'd be really interesting to have this work available, but I think it would pretty much need a working group um, to do this, this level of work and expertise that's brought in. Um, there's many, I mean, obviously, I'm, you already know this, but there's many places that could take advantage of an algorithm like this. We don't have anything that's standardized and usable broadly. Reload is certainly not, right? Um, and so I, I think this would be a good building block tool that we could use for, for, for many things. That said, I think it would have to have a very strong uh, you know, initial customer and group of people who wanted to pull it forward into something to get the critical energy to to be able to do all the work that would be needed to do to publish this. But I like the work. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Colin. Murray. Uh, this is Murray. Just to follow up on Colin's question, does that community exist here or anywhere else? I'm sorry, I didn't properly hear it. Does the community, the kind of community, do you have a do you have a first user? Do you have a 
like developers, like who would join a working group if we were to create one? Well, basically, so if you count ourselves, so we're developing uh, GNUnet essentially, and GNUnet um, has a lot of different applications, for example, also the GNU name system, which is the other RFC that I cited, and that uses this distributed hash table to store its data. Um, beyond that, our R5N implementation is not um, uh, used by any other uh, project. Um, of course, we have been, I think, in con contact with the, with the guys from IPFS as well, um, whether or not they would be interested in something like this. So, but it's not like it's not already used by, by somebody else. Okay. All right. Thanks. Harald Alderstrand. I think that this sounds like something that is more realistic than present DHT for rendezvous in WebRTC. We will always have a problem with WebRTC in that it, uh, it uh, requires a rendezvous server in order to start up. So something that works in the presence of NATS would be acutely interesting for the community that wa wants, they call, it, they call it Burning Man networks, networks that are lar largely disconnected from the internet. And quick question, would this, most of the deployments of NATS in the world are, are uh, single hop. So the procedure sounds like it would uh, have failure modes when, because of the randomness of the random walk. Is it guaranteed to always, always uh, converge in the case of uh, where nodes are just behind a single NAT? I mean, it's not guaranteed to conver converge. I think that you just have a high probability that it, that it finds a local minimum. Thank you. That is one of the questions that we, I would like a working group to answer. And I think I agree with Kellen that this requires working group size effort. Okay, thank you. Okay, so anybody else? So the conclusion I'm hearing is that this kind of work would warrant uh, organizing a working group. So would that be a working group of organizing both, Murray? Uh, if you don't mind, I have one more question before I answer yours. Um, what was the feedback you got when you took this to routing? Sorry, I didn't get it. What was the feedback you got when you took this to routing? It's on the list of working groups where you said you took this before oh. routing, RDG, WG was there. Ah, okay, so that was some time ago, but um, I think the, so we, we basically posted to the mailing list and then we received like a, it wasn't really in a, so it's now in a better state than it was then. So we, we received a lot of feedback on what to improve, but I think there never was an actually follow up or like a, a presentation at the working group before. So kind of the, it fizzled out more or less the, content. Okay, then to answer Jim's question, uh, I think you could try taking this for a buff, but I think before that can succeed, um, we need to see some more evidence of a, a likely community. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank, you. thank you very much. So now move to, to the second one. Um, Philip, are you ready? Do you want to share the slides yourself? yourself? Oh, no, it's, uh, if you, uh, I, I can do it, yes. I'm showing that if you, I can move. Okay, okay I stopped. Please. <clears throat> If you prefer, you can uh, you can move the the, the sides. Uh, I'm sorry. We understood. Maybe you wanted to share the slides yourself. Would you rather we do that? 
Yes, but uh, I think it's better if you if you if you change a side. Okay, so let's why don't we do the shared? Okay. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Shuping. This presentation concerns a proposed extension of the JSON NTV format. It is called JSON NTV, named on type value, and it is described in the internet draft indicated in this slide. I first present the problem, secondly, the objectives pursued by this proposal, and finally, I will address the interest of the IETF in this proposal. Next uh, slide. So, uh, the most used formats for data exchange are JSON and CSV. Everyone knows these formats, and their simplicity makes them easy to understand. But at the same time, these formats are very poor from a semantic point of view. It should also be noted that the CSV format is described in 2005 RFC that is now obsolete. And yet, this format is recommended by the, for the exchange for, of tabular data, for example, by the European community. So, it is difficult to exchange information and everyone uses tricks to decode the data. For example, we can try to convert a string into a date. If it's work, it's a date, otherwise something else. Or we can use sniffing tools which automatize this kind of test. We can also use meaningful names to guess the nature of the information. Next, please. To improve the situation, two strategies are put in place. The first one consists of describing an exchange protocol for the coding and decoding of data. For example, JSON Kima or the experimental RFC JSON type, JSON type definition. This approach is also present to with table Kima for tabular data or with XML data. The second strategy is to define extensions for specific domains. Many extensions are available. In the slide, I show some examples of RFCs. And when I search for JSON with data tracker, I found 50 RFC. For example, GeoJSON defines the exchange format for a geographic location with point or polygon types, but uh, uh, nothing else. Those two strategies work around the problem, but does not meet the request to be able to exchange type data. It should be noted the example of CBOR, which is interesting because it explicitly took into account the notion of type through the concept of tag. Next slide, please. So, uh, what can we do? To define a solution, several objectives are retained. The first is to be able to address the main exchange formats already mentioned. The second is to have a self-supporting solution without the need for a data schema. The third is to be compatible with the existing JSON format. The fourth is to be able to have a binary or textual representation that is reversible. reversible. Reversibility is finding the same data after coding followed by decoding. The fifth is to have, which is to have a simple and easily understandable format while being compact. And finally, the sixth is to be expandable we must be able to integrate complex and not yet defined types of data. 
This is the purpose of the Bison NTV format proposal. The next three slides quickly present how these objectives are achieved. Next slide, please. Um, the zone NTV defines two entities. A simple entity is defined by a value which is Lizon data and optional name and an also optional type. This entity has a JSON representation obtained by combining the name and type with a separator. In the example shown, the entity Equinox is represented by a JSON object with a single member whose k is Equinox colon date. Colon is the separator. This notation was defined in 2020 as part of the JSON ND project, but perhaps it is older. A structured entity is an ordered set of entities that can also have a name and a type. Please uh, note that this, this type is only a default value to apply in the JSON representation. The example indicates two equivalent representations of the same structured entity depending on the type chosen for the structured entity. You will also notice that the separator is different between a single entity, it's a single column, and a structured entity, it's a pair of columns. With the example of the structured entity named Equinox, if the separator was a simple column, this would indicate that the entity is a single entity where the entire JSON object is the value. With these two kind of entities, we can represent any nested structure. In summary, these principles make it possible to meet objectives one, two, and five. Next slide, please. Compatibility with the JSON format is achieved by using a default tip for single entities. For example, if 25 is a JSON value, then it will be interpreted as a simple entity without a name and with a JSON type. For JSON objects with several members or with a JSON arrays, there are structured entities without type. Thus, any JSON data can be interpreted as JSON NTV and conversely, any NTV structure as a JSON representation. The slide shows examples with unnamed structured entities, but I could have added other, more complex examples. The different scenarios that may be encountered are explained in the internet draft and can also be tested on the existing implementation of this format. I will not detail them here. Next slide, please. The text representation is achieved simply by using JSON encoding. This coding is reversible and we find the original data after coding decoding. The binary representation can be obtained using CBOR coding, which is adapted to the coding of types using the concept of tags. A simple mapping between a type and a tag guarantees reversibility. In the example shown, the point type for geographic data corresponds to tag 6.103. It is important to point out that today, CBOR coding is not reversible when using tags as indicated in the RFC in chapter 6.1. I read the sentence. For all other tags, major tip 6, any other tag number, the tag content is represented as a JSON value. The tag number is ignored. This means that we accept losing important information during decoding. 
The proposed format is therefore essential to make the Cibor format reversible. This approach was used in another context for Panda, that Panda data frame as a D-type that is lost do, during JSON encoding. The implementation of JSON NTV and the mapping between Panda D-types and NTV types preserves this information, which makes the G Panda JSON interface reversible. If you are interested, this implementation is also accessible in the Panda ecosystem. For the need for extensibility, the solution chosen was to have standard types for the most common one. Also, nesting types for application to specific domains. And finally, the possibility of having custom types. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Conclude on this proposal, it remains us for us to address the question of the interest of this approach for the IETF. Why is it interesting? The main reason is that in the majority of programming languages, an object is defined by a name, a type, and a set of values. The notion of NTV entity is therefore entirely appropriate. The second reason is that we cannot settle for an interface based on simple JSON, basic, or CSV, too basic and obsolete. Alternative solutions are needed. The proposed solution is not unique or may not be the best, but we need to work on it. The last reason is that the proposed approach remains compatible with existing formats while remaining simple to understand and implement. The, this reason makes the solution usable and deployable. Next slide, please. Last point, uh, why is this interesting for the IETF? The first answer is to say that JSON, JSON and its extension are within the scope of the IETF. The second reason is that the proposed solutions fits well into the IETF's work around JSON. For example, JSON pointer and JSON patch are compatible with the proposal and can also be tested on the existing implementation. The other example, which seems more important to me, is, to, is the complementarity of the solution with Cibor, since it allows coding decoding without of information. Finally, is that the notion of typing is a concern of the IETF. We see this in the work carried out around the RFC vision type definition or the internet draft notable cyber tags. Initiating work on this notion of semantic JSON is therefore an opportunity to move forward in these directions. If we answer yes to the question of the relevance, we must also specify the associated working group. It's difficult for me to give guidance on this point because I don't know enough about the IETF. However, I see complementary options. The first possibility is to include this project in the CBOR working group to have a solution for JSON decoding of tax. The, the other option would be to create a dedicated working group which would make it possible identify all the implications of this type of approach. The question of obsolescence of the CSV format for tabular data would also be a subject of work. To conclude, I will simply say that this topic is an interesting area of work for the ETF, and I will be very happy to work with you. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Philip. Any comments? Thank you. Elliot's first. Hey, good morning. Uh, this is Elliot. Thanks for the presentation. I just have um, sort of one half comment and a half question. Um, 
this seems like uh, uh, that we're doing um, some amount of self-described data uh, at this point, and um, it does begin to make me wonder whether if we're going to go this length, um, is the ground already well trodden in two different respects? Um, is this something where we really should be thinking about uh, how this works both with op uh, in, in terms of the context of open APIs and, and what to do about the relationship between that and JSON schema? And the second question, which may be more obvious to some of the network geeks in the room, is what's the relationship between this and Yang? Thank you. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm, uh, I'm not sure to, to understand all the questions. Uh, the first one is um, how does it work with, uh, uh, with schema? Um, I have a an, an simple answer. Uh, in the interface with Panda, uh, this interface uh, is available for JSON data and is available too with table schema, table schema uh, with the, the, the main, um, the main uh, schema used with the tabular data. Um, the second question with, uh, I'm not sure, uh, with, um, with Il yeah. Ilang, yes, it, it's a it's a with Yang, standard, yes, it, Yang. It's a standard inf information model that we use at the IETF. I, I don't explore this uh, this option, but uh, I'm uh, very open to to this. Uh, I, but uh, I have uh, any answer about that? Uh, Rowan May. I was going to ask if you had talked to, uh, if you had posted this on the Seaboard mailing list, and if so, what the response was. And here comes Karsten. Uh, I don't understand the question. Uh, when I post the, the mail, uh, you, what kind did of. Did you ask the Seaboard working group about this work already? And if so, what was their response? Yes, I have uh, I have asked the the cyber working group, but uh, I don't have any any response about this. Carsten Bormann, uh, for a while, uh, for for cyber noobs, it was kind of an initiation right to write a JSON to cyber to JSON converter, cyber to JSON to cyber converter that is round tripable. Unfortunately, somebody came up and did the Kobayashi Maru thing and said, the, I can write this in one line because I just take the Cibor base 64 URL and code it and put it into a JSON string. And that ended the discussion. Um, I think that, that most uses, usage, usages that actually need to use both JSON and Cibor will want to do something at the application layer. So, for instance, a, a Yang JSON to Yang Cibor converter and back has a pretty clear idea of what it needs to do, and it uses the Yang uh, schema to actually inform uh, the decision. So, when a, a number needs to represent it as a string in JSON and, and all that stuff. So, inventing yet another format on the JSON side is not going to make our work much easier. And the, the this patch question is, I don't think the IETF should be taking on this work. Any further comments on this? Okay, so I think the feedback that we're getting comes in two areas. One is to work, get, get more feedback from Seabor, and the other is that perhaps this is something that shouldn't be taken on by ATF. Are there any other opinions on this? I see Colin getting up. So Colin Jenks, I, I just gonna say, I mean, I don't, I, I don't think the Seabor 
group is going to love doing this. I think we could like, I don't think we need a lot more feedback on that right now. I don't think we should bother getting more feedback. It's already gone there once. We just heard from the chair and the person the Seaboard group's named after. Um, it's all good. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't send them down that path. That just seems like a path of, rust, of frustration to new people coming to the ITF. Um, I don't know what that means we should do next, but I don't think we should send them to the Seaboard group. Uh, hello, I'm Austin Wright, um, editor on JSON Schema, among other things. Um, yeah, uh, my only comment is um, I, uh, JSON and HTTP allow for some similar functionality, um, and I haven't heard any, uh, or I haven't, this hasn't come to my attention uh, until today. So, um, and th there's some amount of overlap in functionality there for sure. Um, so have you approached, like, um, I mean, this question already came up, but, um, I was curious about, have you approached uh, uh, either HTTP APIs or JSON schema the, about um, making sure this functionality, or the functionality that you're looking for is in those specs? Philippe, did you catch the question there? Uh, I don't understand the question. Um, Yes. Uh, have you thought about approaching uh, JSON schema or like uh, HTTP hypermedia um, specifications to to see if similar functionality can be adopted there? Not yet. No. Okay. Um, the, oh yeah, the comment I would add. The, the only interf the, the only interface. Uh, with a uh, data schema is with a uh, table schema for tabular data. Actually, it's the, the only one. Okay. Excuse me, your name, please, and uh, please. Okay, so I think the can Conclusion here, and we'll announce, we'll summarize these at the end of the meeting. But it, it kind of seems like right now this doesn't really have a home in IETF, especially lacking any sort of uptake in some other IETF protocol. Um, okay, shall we go on to the next session, the next uh, presentation, rather? Thank you, Philip. That was a good presentation. Thank you. Great. Are we ready? Cool. Um, well, it's nice to see you all. My name is Michael Tumim, and my first IETF was actually here in Prague. Uh, four years ago. Some of you may remember I presented a thing called Braid, and that is a, so that was the beginning of uh, an informal working group that began at IETF called Braid um, for state synchronization. And now it feels like it's time to propose this as a formal working group. So uh, next slide. Okay. Cool. Well, so, um, so state synchronization, um, I'm going to say most networking protocols implement state synchronization. People are going to argue about this. Uh, Van Jacobson, who created TCP congestion control, went on to have the opinion that all networking is actually is trying to do state synchronization in the end. And you would say FTP is about synchronizing peers. And we have a bunch of example protocols down here. We synchronize files with FTP resources uh, on the web with HTTP emails, um, uh, video, video conferencing state, profiles, um, network data. 
And so all the stuff in applications, we have a lot of synchronization protocols, and then you can even drop down to lower layers and they're synchronizing their synchronization there too with routing tables, um, header compression dictionaries, uh, reachability state, and next slide. And when we're building these synchronization protocols, we tend to follow a certain pattern. So the first thing you do is very simple. You're just like, I need to get this state over there. And so you have a protocol to send the state from A to B and that works out pretty well. Next slide. Um, and that's very simple to do. It's easy to specify, but then over time you want a lot more features. So these are general classes of capabilities that you're gonna want with synchronization protocols. So you're gonna want higher performance. You want push updates. And you know, so the web doesn't provide push updates. It, has, it just relies on the user clicking the reload button whenever the resource changes. FTP was the same way. And so you're gonna, we're gonna add, you're gonna add some kind of pub sub protocol. Um, and then you're gonna wanna have delta compression so that you're only getting the stuff that's changed since the last time you loaded the resource. Then you, today we have a lot of collaborative apps. So like Google Docs, Figma, and we're expecting to have multiple editors be able to edit the same thing over the network, which gets really complicated. Um, it's hard to write that code. You're like, how do I figure that out? I'm gonna use some special algorithms. Um, and you're gonna want things to be consistent and reliable when the network goes down. You wanna have an offline mode. You want it to be okay if my machine fails. And you're also gonna want to eventually make this work without a server or have different network topologies and have a lot of, and then there's versioning, which helps the other capabilities too to have, this is how Git works. You can merge two edits offline because they have a whole history. And so all of these features are general classes of things you're gonna to add to synchronization. Next slide. And, but they, it gets a bit complicated to do it. Um, are we still next sliding? Great, yeah. Um, and, and so we want all these features, but we also want to not have to like spec and build all of this ourselves when we're just doing some particular application. Seems like a lot of work. And then we also want it to interoperate with other systems and we don't want other people to have to implement all the complicated stuff. So we end up making sacrifices in our algorithms. Next slide. I have to learn how to ask for that earlier. So, but anyway, here's, here's a history of, of sacrifices. If we look at the state of all of our algorithms, um, you know, so, POP started off, but it only supported a single client. So then we made IMAP, where you could synchronize with multiple clients. Um, and then we made JMAP, which is a lot more efficient and also lets you synchronize search queries. Um, and HTTP, like I said, it, it didn't bother with updating state after it changed, just punted and said, you're gonna have a reload button. But all of these other apps are built on top of HTTP and wanted synchronization. And, and so they had to add stuff to it and each one did it in a different way. Then we have um, SIP and co-op, which are a lot like HTTP, but wanted synchronization from the get-go. SIP wanted to have real-time video conferencing state. So like I'm calling you and your phone's ringing. And so it said, we're not even gonna bother doing HTTP. We're gonna do something different, but it still looks a lot like it. Um, LDAP and NFS are for you know, files, file, whole file system or a bunch of other information. We have um, synchronization protocols like NetCot, NetConf, Alto, and DNS for synchronizing the stuff of the network. And then down a, a layer, we have routing tables and all these other synchronization protocols. All of these, or we're trying to make these different trade-offs. And um, next slide, let's do, so here's, um, so I'm gonna show you an example of Alto. Um, so, so Alto is doing synchronization over HTTP, but it needed, it, Here's an, uh, a spec that had to be written because we wanted to be able to have incremental updates pushed also. And so we had to figure out how do we do this again? Next slide. And this was just last year. This next one was, so last year um, at, IAT, or sorry, this year at IATF 117 in San Francisco, I was sat in on the skin group and I saw this slide. Uh, and this is how do you uh, reconcile changes when you come back online? and you have to figure out what has changed since last time I was there. So this is for change detection. Um, SKIM is for synchronizing profiles like user accounts across different domains. And 
the, the next slides on this, um, yeah, you can hit the next slide, but they were talking there about, well, we have the trade off of we could do the simple way, which isn't gonna be perfect, but it's gonna be easier to implement, or we could implement the perfect way, which is gonna be a bit harder. How do we make this trade off? And it sure would be nice if we could just do it perfectly and have it already be done in a standard library in a standard way that we're just reusing so we don't have to think about it each time we're implementing a new protocol. So this is a proposal for a group that's a place to solve the general state synchronization problem the cross that, that other protocols can use. And so we'd be producing some common libraries and an abstract model of synchronization that it's like, here's a way to do it. And here's a way to do all these different things. Now, um, synchronization itself is like an indefinite space of stuff. We're not gonna be doing the indefinite space. We're just gonna be scoping out stuff that's useful to implementers. And we can look at all these examples and be like, there's a bunch of basic common stuff that we all need. And over time, we can add stuff in um, based on uh, what people need, what's in demand, and also what's, what's doable to do. And next slide. So this is a model that I'm proposing here because we've actually been doing it, like I said, with the Braid group, this informal working group for the last, last four years. And um, it's worked pretty well. We've, we've produced a spec called Braid HTTP. So we have both an abstract model of synchronization that handles these four aspects, subscriptions. Okay, so I wanna be able to say, give me stuff, keep giving it to me, push it to me. And, um, and I wanna like resubscribe and I wanna get the new stuff since when I was last subscribed. We have patches, so like how do you express a mutation in a general way? And we can apply that to any different MIME type um, in a general way. We also have a general version history that works for, like, works for any of the distributed systems and simple systems. It's easy to specify the stuff. And we have um, merge consistency. And um, so we've done, we've kind of this general model. And then we're also dispatching, that, or dispatching, we're, we're taking the Braid HTTP spec, which is a concrete spec that applies to the HTTP working group. And we're trying to standardize that there. So the general model, we're going to be working with different working groups and creating general infrastructure across them. Um, and it's, it's nice because we can test this stuff. So um, we have this model, the single model, we were able to actually come up with an, uh, a single protocol that can support any CRDT or OT algorithm. And for those of you who don't know what that is, those are, in my opinion, like the state of the art state synchronization algorithms. This is what Google Docs and Figma and all those people are using. Um, and the new ones are really good. They work peer to peer. You can just edit stuff offline, wherever you want, come back online. And no one's ever, I mean, it, it, a lot of people thought it would be impossible to have a single uh, protocol that could support any of them, but we succeeded and we can show it because we have these tests that let them interoperate. And, um, okay, next slide. Oh, should we take the queue now, or should we just keep? You can oh. finish, finish. Okay, let's just keep going. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, I think yeah. Two, okay, so so what we get from this common infrastructure is we can raise the level of abstraction. Um, we say in the Braid group that you should be able to read and write any remote state on the network as easily as a local variable. And so when you are writing your specs and when you're writing your implementations. Instead of doing all the networking yourself, you're just gonna say, what does my data structure look like? And now I'm gonna issue patches to it or react to patches to it. And this is what it's gonna look like. So this is um, our actual tools. This is your JavaScript console. And so you can access that state uh, at this HTTPS URL for a chat as a variable. And there you get an array of, of messages in it. And then we can push a new message onto the chat and just using JavaScript push. And then we can change the first message's username to Alice. And down below, you see what the other peer receives over the internet, and it's automatically updated. Each of these versions comes in because it's subscribed to the state, and, each, and it automatically creates versions and patches from your manipulating of this, of this variable. So this is what it's gonna look like to um, to program and write specs at this higher level of abstraction makes it way easier. And next slide, last slide, I hope. Great. Uh, okay, great. So we're gonna be able to raise the level of abstraction dramatically um, for state synchronization. 
This is going to make it much easier to write, to, to create our protocols, much easier to build them. We're going to have a new level of interoperability because we're going to have a common model for synchronization. So I'm going to be able to access the state of my printer in the same way that I'm accessing the state of my profiles and the same way that I'm accessing my files. And, um, and, this, is an, an, and this common substrate is going to have much better functionality with better networking robustness, uh, conflict resolution, history, all this stuff built in, which is going to be a major upgrade to our networking across the board. So that's the motivation for creating a state synchronization working group, a place where we can work on the general problem. And um, gradually over time, we can increase the scope, add in some more features. We'll have to do that very selectively. Um, and there is a big question, like some, some things that we've noticed in the Braid group. Um, one thing is that it is very helpful to have researchers and research knowledge about distributed systems and these, these new algorithms in the same room or the same process as implementers to put those two together so that the needs are met by expert abstract knowledge because in the process to create these general protocols, we are also simplifying and generalizing our knowledge of the protocols and of the algorithms. And so we've had this question of, do we want an IRTF research group or a working group? And I believe that we want a working group. And because the focus of this group should be creating those common standards, um, at least com the common abstract protocol. And we can, in the process of a working group, we can incorporate knowledge from research and we can also do research in a working group, but you can't really do the other way. And we want the focus to be on creating the common infrastructure. Um, but this is a question for dispatch. We have a bunch of people in the queue, so let's... Get to it. Go ahead, Ted. Uh, Ted Hardy, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I, I wondered first if you had talked to the usable formal methods uh, proposed research group folks or not. I have not talked to the formal methods research group. OK. So uh, one of the two outputs you uh, described in, in this was you wanted to be able to create an abstraction uh, that described the different state synchronization aspects of it. I believe the usable formal methods group uh, might be a useful uh, set of folks for you to talk to because obviously state uh, synchronization, event management, et cetera, are all things that uh, formal methods would like to be able to describe in the abstract. And so I think for the purposes of uh, trying to work with the research community, there's already a group gathered there. Um, I believe that that might be a useful connection for you to make here. Uh, the second half of what you described in creating a set of common libraries and a, and a, a common abstract protocol, um, our experience is that when you build it with that intent, uh, it tends mm -hmm. not to be tremendously successful. But if you build something very useful, people tend to poach it very readily. Um, and so we, we see the reuse of protocols in, in the ITF mostly because they prove themselves over time uh, to handle a particular set of um, uh, tasks very well. And whether or not they were abstract to begin with isn't so important as the fact that the other bits uh, were able to borrow them readily. So I would say that uh, trying to tackle something with the, the statement that you want to create an abstract substrate uh, is probably not going to work. But if you say, we want to build um, a, a set of libraries or a, a, a set of functions that work very well with HTTP and HTTP built uh, protocols, then that focus as Braid started out with may get adopted very quickly by other groups. Um, in, in effect though, I think your current scope is probably too large to tackle in either a working group or a research group because some of what you talked about, you know, being able to check and change the state of uh, different values on the network as easily as locally. Um, some of those are actually in different protocols where different authentication methods and uh, different potentially um, uh, network availability of resources is going to be a problem. And so just like Quick has to have a fallback to HTTP, you probably are going to have situations where it is absolutely not possible to do this across all the state a particular user or application might want simply because they don't have uh, either the application or the network path to do that. Uh, so I think maybe you should narrow the scope to um, a particular set of applications that want to use it and build the formal methods uh, abstraction in the research group and the uh, working group either afterwards or in parallel 
could could take on that more narrow scope. Thank you. Okay, we've got a long queue, so please try and keep your comments or questions kind of short. Go ahead, Elliot. Well, uh, I think Ted covered mo most of the ground that I was going to cover, only I was going to be a little bit more succinct and simply ask, do you have two disparate applications that you're looking to apply, especially, you know, say from, you, you had that slide that covered, you know, everything from HTTP down to uh, NetConf and routing. Do, do you have two disparate applications ready to go? Michael, did you get the question? Um, yeah, I, I heard the question was, I have two applications my, ready to go. My question is, do you have two disparate applications of Braid ready to go in terms of will, willing to test with you, willing to work with you to develop the appropriate abstract <coughs> model so that it, it, it stretches in terms of generalization? Oh, um, we, we, so we do, uh, it, we do have applications, um, uh, web applications. So far, we've been mostly focused on web applications. We have um, some chats and some wikis that are like small applications. We haven't had as much, uh, yeah, does, does that answer your question? Yeah, I was looking how far down the stack you want to go, how far, you know, into the network world you want to go. You Thank you, to, yeah. Do you yeah, want to so, go with BGP, you know? Where, 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 where yeah, so, uh, uh, no, down the network stack, that's all, like, potential possible future scope creep. The focus right now would be, um, is it, just a simple application, so, like, email, chat, kind of, like, very basic stuff. We would expand scope from there, but we'd start out by saying, hey, you're already building some apps. We can automatically synchronize that with you, give you offline mode, collaborative editing, um, history. It's going to be easier to write your code, and you're going to get better features because we're going to have all this common infrastructure. And we've already built a bunch of this, actually. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Elliot, your question, I mean, your answer to the dispatch question? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of neutral, but it sounds really interesting. And um, if the choice were to be between a working group and a research group, I think it's closer to a working group. Thank you. Mark? Um, Mark Nottingham. I am somewhat enthusiastic about this work uh, in HTTP specifically. I think that if we thread the needle and get uh, enough interest in giving it a decent amount of review, we can go forward and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that later this week. Um, I am concerned about an overarching working group about this. And, and that's because in general, the, these top-down efforts, uh, uh, much like Ted said, uh, uh, tend to fail. They don't tend to match the work very well. Um, uh, in, in that you, you often have to make a lot of compromises to paper over the differences between the different use cases and the different technologies. And those compromises are, are gaps that interoperability suffers in. And we've seen this time and time again. Um, and, and so I'd be very wary of, of a, an attempt to try and have a, a, a you know, high level working group for this. I think doing it protocol by protocol and repeating best practice as much as Ted had, uh, alluded to is, is the right approach and it's very much the IOTF approach to this kind of problem. Uh, uh, although we have things like Sazzle where that's the exception and that's had a lot of trouble getting adoption and, 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 and getting matched into applications well. Um, so, so that's what I would recommend. I do, I do wonder if, if there's maybe a place for a research group uh, uh, to talk about you know, the patterns, the best practice, and to do that research work, but not to produce protocols and, and not to do that work. If you're going to modify HTTP, HTTP, it should be within the HTTP community. If you mod modify, I don't know, email, it should be within that email community, make sure that it has those appropriate lines rather than trying to impose it from a, a more theoretical direction. Uh, so that would be my answer to this past question is definitely not a working group, maybe a research group, but, but really targeted efforts within certain communities. Uh, this is Daniel Con gilmore from ACLU. Um, so uh, I'm usually loath to disagree with either I'm not or Ted. Um, and maybe I am agreeing, actually. Uh, I think as a dispatch outcome, this might be two working groups. <laughs> uh, and maybe the, the research part can be pushed. Uh, if the formal methods folks are interested, you can maybe pick that up there. Um, I'm, I, would, I just wanted to stand up and say that uh, in LAMPS, we had the end-to-end -end mail guidance, end-to-end -end encrypted mail guidance discussion that identified major gaps in what we don't have, and actually synchronizing state between mail user agents that are connected to the same email account um, is a major gap. And something like this would be super useful to have in an IMAP context. Um, and uh, however, like, like Mark said just now, 
I am not convinced that one working group would have the right expertise to figure out how to do this in IMAP as well as in HTTP. So I would love to understand how we can get the theoretical results here applied to, um, say, mail user agents that share an IMAP box. But I don't know that, that's, that the folks who know how to do that with HTTP will know how to do that in IMAP or vice versa. So that's what I'm saying. Maybe it's an, maybe, maybe we bring this work. I'll agree with Mark that, that this is protocol specific, I think. Uh, David Skenazi, uh, Internet Architecture Enthusiast. I, you said one word that really scared me, and it was generalized. Um, to echo what other people have said, it's the ITF does not know how to solve generalized problem. Like, we have failed at every single attempt I've personally seen. And that's because it is objectively hard, and uh, applying this like state synchronization to HTTP or to IMAP will look completely differently. So my personal take on the dispatch question is that starting a working group for this, I don't think it will be successful, whether a working group or a research group, but taking individual instantiations and bringing them to HTTP or other groups and seeing if there, there are enough people who want to use it would be more, much more likely to lead you to success. Austin. Hello, Austin Wright again. Um, I'll maybe split the baby down the middle of those last few opinions. Um, HTTP is a wonderful general application of a protocol which you can deploy to do any number of things. And as you showed, it can be used to do implement any number of user applications. Um, and I think some of the shortcomings you've identified are very specific niche things like how do we um, do subscriptions and talk about data um, and you know, I'm a fan of RDF um, which, which, and, and things like that. I do JSON schema, which is specifically about talking about partitioning or identifying and talking about data. Um, and, and so these technologies sort of already exist and it, it, it seems like we could use, um, uh, there's already working groups for most of these problems, or the, the, most of these problems would be in the scope for a particular working group already. It's just that we want to put out or identify some best practices and um, unifying some of the technology around synchronization. Um, I've uh, been putting out a spec for synchronization myself um, recently, of course. Um, for um, byte range batch. All right, thank so, you. We're, we're running behind. So yes, um, I, I, I would maybe suggest uh, a, a research group, and then we can um, identify specific re recommendations for specific technologies, like how do we bring synchronization um, uh, that to HTTP biz or HTTP APIs. Hi, Alistair. 20 years ago, I committed an RFC. RFC 3254. I had to look it up. Uh, about defining, apparently, consistency. Turns out there's not one. There's many. And what protocols are useful depends strongly on the questions you want to ask. I find this presentation convincing in that we should have a working group to standardize or generalize the approach you have, the, the toolkit you have come, come up with. But I contrast this to the M MLS working group, which has a huge set of RFCs defining exactly state synchronization, but where the problems to be solved and the requirements on the on the solution are different than in other contexts. So to answer the dispatch questions, no, this general thing is not baked enough to be anywhere near uh, an ITF working group. It might be a valid research to refine the language we use to speak about synchronization. Yes, this may be there might be a toolkit that has been developed 
in the uh, as given that is valuable to standardize and uh, show how it's applicable to multiple applications. So go not to the elves for answer. For they will say both yes and no. Carsten Bormann, co-chair of the core working group, which has a protocol with a little bit of state synchronization. Co-op, you mentioned that. Um, I would like to steal from you. So, um, but that's not my answer to the dispatch question. Um, we, we have a model that maybe we should be looking at. You said the IRTF cannot do standards. That's definitely true, but they can prepare standards. And um, about 500 years ago, when uh, delay tolerant networking came came uh, to prime time, uh, a research group was made, and that research group looked at the problem and then came up with an experimental protocol that, that uh, was developed in, in a large effort involving many researchers, and that actually was deployed in, in some form in space. Um, and uh, then at some point when, when that experiment was done, a DTN working group was formed in the uh, IETF to actually come up with a production version of this protocol. And that production version now exists. It's bundled protocol version 7 for some reason. Um, and the, the whole effort was successful in, in its uh, well-defined uh, space. So my dispatch proposal uh, would be to uh, consider the same uh, approach, see if a good research group can be formed out of this, but with a view to getting an experimental uh, protocol agreed in that research group and then taking it to a workshop. Hi, Phil Hearn Baker. Yeah, uh, I'm also in the research group camp, and here's why I've built one of these as well. And everything in the mesh is represented as an append only list, and it has cryptography built into the construction of the list so that every list is a Merkle tree and authentication, encryption rolled in, and so on. And I'm pretty well aware of the specific optimizations I have required to get performance for my particular application that make my approach non-general. It's not, you know, it's, it's designed to solve my problems, and I know the, what the costs of making it more general will be. And so, you know, it, once you decided everything's a list and you're never going to delete stuff, you know, well, that's a fairly big commitment, you probably don't want to have gigabytes of data being added as chunks onto that list. Uh, so I'm a bit skeptical of the idea of a generic system. I'm also really, you know, my experience of saying, hey, I've got this bright, shiny object. Hey, you know, just getting people to look at it is hard enough. Getting people to use it, I don't think it's going to happen. So I think a research group and look at the fundamentals, get some formal methods in there, and uh, then take it from there and see if that w information can fun funnel back into the wider ITF is the way forward. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, um, so uh, one issue with the research group, we talked to the, um, the uh, chair of I IRTF, last IETF, and one thing he said was that uh, research groups have a time span, they're expected to produce results over a period of like two, five, 10 years, when we are already producing some things that, some common models that need to be standardized. So we felt like that time scale didn't really fit. Um, I see some, some shaking of heads. Um, <laughs> I'll accept that. And then um, we have had a lot of, with your specific point about optimizations, surprisingly, a lot of these can be generalized in our experience. We have produced the fastest CRDTs in our group and also have generalized them, but. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Um, and also, I appreciate all, all of the discussion. Uh, really good comments. Um, I feel a lot of resonance with a lot of you as well. So thank you very much. Okay, so it, it sounds as though the rough consensus here is something more along the lines of a research group, even though that's not the, the preference. Uh, I mean, the concern is we don't want to create a protocol that's an orphan that kind of like is very general, but nobody actually uses. Okay. 
John Levine. Thank you. Well, I hope this one will be easy. Next slide, please. Who's driving? Two ping is it? It's a little slow. Okay, here we go. Um, for all of the, for everybody who uses webmail, um, one of the features that every webmail includes is a way to say this message is junk. So the user reads her mail, the, and the, 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 she decides something is junk. She pushes the junk button, and in most cases, the provider then tell, tell, sends, will then tell the sender that hey, this was reported as, as junk. Um, Gmail is sort of an exception here, but every, every um, Microsoft does, Yahoo does, large uh, cable providers like Comcast do. Next, please. So the way, the way it works now is if you want to get reports about mail you send that your recipients have complained about, you figure out some, some way to figure out which mail system do you want to talk to. And then you go and tell them like, hey, these are, these are the IP addresses that I send from. At, at which point, whenever, whenever, there is a, whenever somebody reports something as junk that comes from one of your IP addresses, they send you an ARF report. And this actually works pretty well. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I run a handful of mailing lists, you know, and I get, and I send mail to, to places, and I get a trickle of reports when people at, like Outlook report one of my mailing list messages as spam, typically for reasons I don't understand, but at least it lets me unsubscribe them and make the complaints go away. Yahoo does it differently. Yahoo, rather than keying it to the IP address, you, you, you go through the same secret process and you say, these are the domains I control. So if they see a message, if they get a, a, a junk report about a message and it has your DKIM signature on it, then they, will, then they will send it to the private address that you registered. So most people use IP addresses. Yahoo uses DKIM signatures. But next slide, please. Okay, there's two reasons this, uh, this two, there's two reasons this is not great. One is that it's like it's it's sort of a it, there's, it, there's there's a definite secret squirrel aspect, you know, like if you if you don't belong to Mog, then it's very difficult to figure out where to uh, where to register stuff. And for obvious reasons, <clears throat> there are middlemen and historically there have been middlemen who say register with us and we'll tell all these providers, which is fine. But some of the middlemen are now have now decided that uh, that their business plan requires that every everything be monetized, and they're and they're and they're starting to charge people for for allowing to get reports about your spam, which everybody agrees is terrible. So, next slide. So this draft is quite simple. It simply says we're going to formalize what Yahoo does. Um, we're going to define a record you can put in you, you you can put in your in your DNS sort of adjacent to your DKIM keys. It basically says, if you get a, a, a junk report about a message and it has this DK, you know, and it has this DKIM domain signing it, then send me the reports. So there's no middleman and it scales with the DNS and everything will be great. And just to emphasize something down to the problem, we're not reporting DKIM failures. This is sim this is still to report to to to, um, to root manual manual junk reports. So it's simply taking what people already do with the junk button. And making it so that we can we can route the messages for free in a, more, in a way that scales better and is more reliable. So I think I have one more slide. Yeah. So we have the usual questions. It's like um, we have a draft that Alex Brotman of Comcast wrote. Uh, it looks pretty good to me, which is why I'm here pitching it. Um, I would like to uh, send it down the standards track since um, people in the business all agree this would be a good thing to do, and it's not obvious where to put it. Um, some people suggested the DMARC working group. It is definitely not DMARC. Um, so it could be AD sponsored. It could be a mini working group. And uh, there's a line that actually I added after you copied this, which is there's an, there's, there's an existing experimental draft that has an, an alternative approach where you, where you put the address to send the report in a header line in the message, which is supposed to be signed. So if we do this, I would also want to reconcile. It's like, like if the DKIMS, you know, if the DNS says send the report here and the message sends says send the report there, do you do both? Do you do one? Do you do the other? That's the sort of thing that we would have to work out, but it's really a detail. So yeah, my question is like, assuming you think this is not a terrible idea, how can we move it ahead? Okay, thank you. Okay, PHP is first in the queue. Oh, Are no, you left that's, over? that's a leftover, sorry. DKG. Uh, hi, Daniel Con gilmore um, so this seems totally reasonable to do. Uh, I think if you're going to do it as a DNS record, I don't, I mean, maybe DNS, one of the DNS working groups would be willing to pick it up just as a way to specify um, 
Dan, could you, could you, can you speak up? You're hard to hear. Sorry. Uh, if the plan is to do this as in the DNS, as you're describing here, and you're not planning on doing anything like specifying the format of the, of the report message or anything like that, then I'm not sure why you can't just do this in a DNS working group. Um, it seems like a reasonable thing. You're basically saying this is a record, this is a rec uh, you know, one of the ways that people will access the DNS. Um, I don't know how you would square that with uh, trying to reconcile the, the header-based approach, though. Oh, um, if the draft actually specifies the, the, in answer to your question, it's not a, I mean, it, it's a regular old text record, just like the DKIM keys are. Okay. And, it, and the, and, and the, and the draft actually specifies, here's what goes in the record. Here's, you know, here, here's the fields that say where you send stuff. And then there's some also, like if, if the reports go to a different domain than yours, then there's some extra stuff that we borrowed from DMR okay. to avoid I, I take back people. my thought that this is a, a DNS thing. I, sorry about that. So, yeah. so yeah, yeah. It's, it sounds much more mail related. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I, no, I, have, I have no idea where to put it then. Sorry. I mean, it, it would be nice if we had sort of a general mail stuff group because we have, we have a trickle of this stuff coming through all the time. Murray is next. That last thing you said isn't happening. Um, uh, this is, is Yahoo planning to do this? If they, have you talked to them about it? Um, I haven't talked to Richard lately, but I think they would be sympathetic. Okay, it's, uh, if we did, were to do this, you know, we're gonna have to develop consensus and all that kind of stuff. If we don't have a working group for it, um, is MOG, we're we gonna get any kind of participation from MOG to, to work this through the process? Or is it pretty much gonna be you and Alex? I mean, certainly at, at, the, at the MOG meeting last month, there was a lot of enthusiasm for it. Okay. So, I mean, if, if you want, you know, when, I mean, we, we have a pretty good draft, you know, and, and you know, and we, since no, no good deed goes unpunished, we right. can simply say, Murray, could you sponsor this? But I was hoping not to go that route just because I know you're kind of busy. I, I was hoping you wouldn't go that route too, but it's, <laughs> it's, it seems like the, the path of least resistance given, you know, spinning up working groups that MOG tends to like results in pretty much no activity. So. Uh, let's, we can talk about it. Yeah. Barry? Barry Lieber, chair of the DMARC working group and IETF liaison to MOG to give context. Uh, yes, this is not DMARC. Um, it's also not uh, DKIM because the DKIM working group is working on a different problem. Um, two things about it. I would say we should do a working group simply because any kind of email abuse thing brings out all of the email people and uh, AD sponsoring this would probably be a mess for Murray. Um, on the other hand, maybe AD sponsoring it will reduce the level of crazy email people who show up. I don't know. I mean, I, I have a draft yeah. about resuscitating the expires header, which we could also put into such a working group. Yeah. The, um, certainly, I've, I've looked at Alex's um, draft and it, it looks it looks good we definitely should do it the other thing is that in from the mog side we always get a lot of interest in mog for this stuff and we always get a dearth of actual activity from mog people coming here to do it and i've been as liaison trying to drum that up for years and had trouble with it uh, i think it would be very important for this to make sure that we engage the mog people and uh Maybe the right thing to do is to pass this around MOG a bit more and get something solid from them that we can bring to the IETF where, where they have agreement that we've already got it right and then we can come back and start and, and AD sponsor it with, um, with the fact that MOG's already backing the solution we have. Yeah, I mean, I we, we certainly have put a few drafts, well, like the, the header draft came from MOG, but yeah, my, my experience there is we get we get one or two people at MOG who actually know how to do this stuff. E exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Elliot. And certainly Alex is a, a big MOG guy. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. so I, I realize there's not 100% direct comparison here, but um, I wonder if you guys could start by leveraging uh, Philippe's work in um, RFC 9477 in the complaint uh, feedback form, uh, the feedback header that he, he just defined. Yeah, that's the that, that's the line that that yeah the. <clears throat> so anyway, as you go to charter, you might want to or or you, you might want to drop that into you know why not or why or, or how. Yeah, no, I, I I thought I mentioned that. Okay, I missed that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, it's like yeah, it's definitely it's definitely overlaps with the with the the header. Okay. Anyone else? 
I see Alex. No, he's not stopping at the microphone. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Uh, I'm happy to help. Sorry, I didn't put myself in the queue. Happy to help, but I, I don't have an opinion about, um, you know, AD sponsoring versus uh, working group. All right. My sense of the feedback is that we're hoping for more of a commitment of participation from MOG rather than just a suggestion that we go off and do something. Yeah. And uh, if we can get that, then it might be reasonable to do like a, a mini working group and 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 all that because because AD I, I think people are kind of agreed that AD sponsoring this would be kind of a mess. Yeah, yeah. Why don't Barry and I see if we can uh, put together a pipeline and blog and we can come back and follow you next? Well, I'm not going to be in 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 Australia, but around then. Okay. Uh, sure. Yes. So a quick summary of the dispatch outcomes. So for the first one, um, to have a working group is uh, was suggested, but uh, uh, AD wants to see more evidence. And before that, and the second one is uh, uh, more discussions uh, will be needed, and CBOR is not uh, the right place. So try to maybe try to get more feedback from the. JSON schema. And something related with Tuesday morning, uh, evening event. So please uh, reach out. The third one is uh, try to narrow down the scale, the scope and uh, if to form a, a working group, maybe a research group. And uh, the, the last one is uh, try to get more uh, feedback and make it more solid. So that uh, finish our dispatch session and now is the art area meeting. So our 80s, I'm going to share the slides. Yeah, Hi, everyone. It's been a while. Nice to see you all. Hi. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Next slide. So the chairs have compiled a very nice meeting of interest uh, for us for this week. We have a new working group meeting for the first time, SML, Monday, today. Uh, there is some uh, there is some buffs. We only have one in art, which is the whimsy one, but you're uh, very welcome to join all of them. And then there is listed some, some side meetings there. Uh, you can uh, read the description in the side meetings page. And then we have SEC dispatch, IEB open gen dispatch as usual. There, there is also a gen area meeting, uh, this ITF. There was right. also, uh, we didn't manage to charter VCon in time, but they did get an agenda slot, so we flagged it as a boff. They just can't conduct any working group business, but they have yet to keep their slot. So that's, uh, you might conclude them under boffs there. Right, VCon. Next slide. So um, I just wanted to, to mention the area restructuring that is happening. If you haven't seen the many announcements that have been sent out, then you will see it. Uh, this slide and uh, a couple more times during some meetings. But basically what is happening is that part of transport and part of art will soon merge into a new area that is called Web and Internet Transport or WIT. Um, so some of the art working groups that are security related will go back or go to security. Um, uh, the web art working groups will go into WIT. Uh, together with some of the transport working groups and other 
ops and int related working groups in transport will go to ops and int. Um, and art will stay with the rest of the working groups. So the timeline is by ITF 119, and there is, will possibly be a transition period starting in January 2024, and that's not super clear or specified right now, so more information to come. Next slide. And for the details of which working groups are moving, which ones are staying, these are the ones that will move to WIT. So in green are the ones uh, from ART. So those are AVT Core, CDNI Core, HTTP API, HTTP BIS, Mock, RTC Web, WebTrans, and WISH. Um, and then that will leave ART is Skim, Tigress, and Utah. Uh, there is uh, two small changes from um, the announcement that was sent. Uh, the changes are WISH was not mentioned in the, in the announcement, but we'll go to WIT. Um, and Utah was not mentioned either, and we'll go to SEC. And just to clarify, to start, uh, so there will be some um, AD reshuffling for, for these working groups, as well as the ones that uh, stay in art, but uh, I guess that's, that's gonna be handled when the new ISG is seated in March anyway, so we will need to take care of that as well. So yeah, so you're all aware of this, and uh, yeah. I don't know if there is any questions or, or anything, but if we have time. Uh, Colin Jones, I mean, is the ISG seeking any feedback on this, or is it just a fait accompli? We have gotten feedback, and there's okay. been a, yeah. <laughs> So it's a fait accompli is the answer then. They're not seeking feedback is the answer, right? Right. Okay, got it. Um, it's probably too late to stop the, the creation of the area, but if you have feedback on which groups should move and all that kind of stuff, there's probably a little time to make adjustments. Okay, thank you. Mark? Mark? Oh, sorry, I don't see the queue. Uh, Mark Nottingham, yeah, I gave some of that feedback. I'm not going to bring it up again, but uh, I really think we need to have a discussion in the community about the impact, especially on dispatch and on the area meetings and, and area coordination, because it's already problematic and adding a new area into the mix is going to make it more so. Thanks, Mark. And we have taken that feedback and we have been discussing this within the ISG and there might be some outcome to your proposal. We will wait patiently, I suppose. <laughs> yes. Uh, Ted Hurdy, uh, I also gave some of that feedback, and I won't won't uh, uh, rehash it here. But I I do think that there's definitely an opportunity for us to bike shed li lightly here. Um, the wit and art. Uh, I'm not sure that art actually matches the applications and real time matches the resulting group. Should we go back to apps? <laughs> Do you mean the description doesn't match the the groups that are? Well, you've taken many of the things that were the real time bits of art and moved them into wit. Um, maybe it would be a better description of the the resulting change to call them apps and wit instead of art and wit. But I see, as in all bike sheds, uh, people are immediately unhappy because Robert has shaken his head like I am uh, about to uh, paint cerulean, uh, something which definitely ought to be hunter green. So uh, I just think maybe it would be worth thinking about the name a little bit so that it is fully descriptive, um, but it is definitely a bike shed. I mean, we did look uh, at the description of the area um, and uh, considered that that was still accurate, but uh, we definitely will have to uh, confirm that. And we are also going to have to uh, write up a description for wit at the same time. So we do that. Thank you. Thank you. We got one topic in the art area. Uh, the presenter, please.
Hi everyone, I'm Kehan from China Mobile. And today I'm uh, prepare a um, new topic, collective communication, uh, which might be, uh, which is a new topic for art area, but might be interested to uh, some of you guys. So we have prepared to draft to uh, submit it to TSV working group, but why today I want to present it in art area, because I think the collective communication optimization work is a cross layer design. So um, we want to talk about it today. So next slide, please. Um, so what is collective communication? A collective communication is an inter-process communication model that plays a key role in um, high performance computing and um, modern distributed AI uh, training workloads. And uh, it involves a group of uh, processes participating in collective operations like uh, one-to-many and um, uh, many-to-one and all-to-all patterns and usually realized by a sequence of unicast messages in underlying network. So next slide, please. And collective communication has a wide area, a, a wide range of application and in data center networking like uh, distributed AI model training and big data analysis applications and distributed storage. Because in today's data center networking, this, uh, there is a trend that these applications, uh, the underlying network are, are trying to be uh, converged to offer uh, capabilities for different applications like this. Next slide, please. So uh, as you, uh, we, I listed in this page of typical collective operations uh, like uh, data movement and data aggregation and the synchronizations. If you are more interested in this, uh, you can see my slide. Uh, you, you can view our uh, drafts. So next slide, please. So uh, the major problems for uh, these applications is that uh, the current implementation of collective operations in the underlying network is point to point. Sorry about I use P2P, but uh, uh, the P2P has a, another specific meaning, but I mean point to point implementation of the collectives in the current uh, network will introduce a lot of overhead. It uh, major reflected in three uh, perspectives. One is that it will um, occupy large bandwidth because there are a lot of duplications and redundancy in the transmission of the packets and also it will introduce a uh, much data movement uh, in the end-to-end -end transmission of these packets. And also there are a large number of data copies and endpoints. So it will, these three perspectives will introduce a large, uh, a, a very uh, severe problem of the communication bottleneck and it will uh, definitely uh, degrade the performance of these applications, especially in the distributed AI uh, training workloads. So that if we want to design a performant um, network infrastructure, we need to save bandwidth because bandwidth is, is extremely um, important to bandwidth sensitive applications. And uh, it is a new oil for the application because if we want to build um, like, uh, uh, you want to train trillions uh, numbers of parameters model, you need to spend about 10,000 network cars and uh, accelerators build the infrastructure and you need to spend a, a, a around hundreds of millions of dollars. So the bandwidth and new oil and you need to reduce data movement and decrease data copies. So what you should do, you need to offloading the collective operation to the network to, to achieve more benefits and uh, to design performance applications. So next slide, please. So why it is um, should be intro uh, introduced in art area? I will uh, later show some of the uh, like issues in the transport, like issues in the uh, it uh, like IP modicast and also uh, like uh, 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 operation and management areas. But why it should be introduced in art area? Uh, because the currently the the application programming, if you want the implementing. Uh, of the collective operations, you need to, the uh, distributed application, they need to call the APIs to implement these collective operations. Um, but currently, the, uh, it is not performant enough. So uh, introducing, as I said, introducing collective operation offloading will make it better. And uh, currently, the, these applications, the API is not designed with its 
the, the offloading mechanism. So I think the API should be redesigned and modified to improve uh, the behaviors of these applications. And I, that's why we think it's related to art area. And uh, so uh, the, the also uh, what should be standardized here. So the lower level, uh, people may think about the lower level implementation of these collectives might differ in the vendors, but uh, the API should be extended to be common, commonly used for the applications. So next slide, please. And also, uh, like I said, um, there are a lot of issues because the topics cross layers. Across layers, we we well, uh, we listed several issues that are related to the transport, to the um, uh, networking layer, like IP MOSFETs for um, the message passing, and also like introducing some control and the management mechanism uh, for the operations areas. If you are interested, you can go over, uh, go through the drafts to see uh, the details. And next slide, please. Uh, I will quickly go through uh, these, uh, very quickly go through these uh, issues. Like uh, in the transport, there are some reliability issues in the implementation of the uh, um, collectives uh, offload because we need to, for example, we need to uh, realize group to one mode. Uh, currently, uh, there, are, uh, there is only a point-to-point -point reliability in the transport uh, protocol design. If you want to uh, realize it, in the, introduce it in group to one mode, you need to think about the intermediate, how the intermediate network nodes should behave. There are two uh, major options, like uh, it can behave like an endpoint to break the transport function, but it may have some issues like maintaining too much states, or it can act as a transparent and uh, transparent node, which doesn't, uh, which doesn't need to maintain full transport function, but needs to be aware of the operations it should be performed on the packets. So there might, might be some design space to, uh, to realize the multi-point to one-point reliability transport issues. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Rowan, did you have a clarifying question? Um, sure, yeah, Rowan May. Um, uh, I, I read your, you know, read the first, the, the abstract in the first couple of chapters of your, your internet draft, and I feel like I started reading a book from the chapter three. Um, I'm wondering if you could, if you could just say what the, you know, what, IT, what IETF protocols you're already using, if any, and like just give a, like a higher level or earlier introduction to this problem, please. Uh, because I think a lot of people here are, are either, you know, maybe guessing as to what you're trying to, what, where you're trying to accomplish at the very high level. Thank you. Uh, um, so, sorry, I think I'm not try um, very quickly get your, what you mean because of the mask. So uh, do you mean that, uh, uh, what I talk should be more related to art area. To, there is a, a high level summa uh, summarization of I'm, this I'm, topic. I'm trying to I'm trying to make sure that I understand the problem that you're trying yes. to solve, and I didn't get enough of in, enough of that information from starting from you know knowing less from your from your draft, and I was hoping that you might be able to say like what ITF protocols you are using now that are not solving your problem, if any, and what the overall, you know, bigger, bigger picture of your problem is. Um, yeah, um, maybe you can just go back to the, the first slide about the, 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 um, uh, the concept, the page. I think, yeah, I think uh, I will quickly go through the, the problem space because uh, uh, first, we, we need to understand what is collect communication. Maybe you can you already understand because it's an enterprise communication model. And the, the major problem here is that current implementation, the underlying network, is point to point, but it introduce a lot of overhead. Yeah. So, it's the when you say interprocess communication. Yeah. It's I, I think you assume that we all know what you mean, and. What, what I'm asking is, be more specific, please, about inner process communication between which processes and using what protocols and what part of the network. Okay. And then I think a lot, of, a lot more people here are gonna understand your, the, you know, 
the further details of your of your proposal. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. So um, there were some proprietary uh, design of the collective communication, like uh, using RDMA-based uh, uh, transport protocols to implement this, uh, these models. But they are not performing enough because they haven't introduced collective communication operation uh, offloading mechanisms, and it needs some design space to improve the mechanism. So I think uh, this the work will I know span a lot of areas like transport areas and also uh, like networking areas and also uh, the operate OPS area and also it needs to be finally designed uh, uh, APIs that. Uh, um, Friendly and uh, friendly to the uh, developers to design these applications. So I think that part uh, work should be within the scope of art area. So I hope my uh, my explanation will be helpful. Thank you. So maybe we can quickly just go to the the, the last page of the slide. Um, Sorry. We'll take one more. The most important one. Um. Yes. The, the last page. Last. Uh, Yes, I, I think I won't go and into the details of the these drops. So, uh, just quickly, a broadcast of the side meeting that uh, will be held on Thursday, uh, November 9th. Uh, so, if you are interested, you can come to see what we, what, what we want to show to you guys, and we'll come for more discussions and contribution. Thank you, guys. Okay, thank you. So. We don't have uh, any other questions. So maybe Maury, so you have something to say? Yes. Uh, actually, I should talk. Uh, good morning. Just before we adjourn, I wanted to remind everyone that this is the week that NOMCOM is doing its interviews of uh, people in various seated positions. So if you have feedback for anybody who has accepted nomination, please do take the time to do it. They could really, they would really uh, appreciate that feedback. You'll be reminded several times throughout the week, I realize, but I wanted to get the first one in. So thanks. Any other business or other announcements for the meeting? All right, I guess not, so we're done. Thank you for attending the session and have a good week. So far, seems good. Yeah, I may do a little bit of, of just.